I say chapter 1 out of habit, but it's really only got the one chapter. So we're looking at verses 22 through 23. The call of compassion. Trust you received a worksheet when you came in. If you did not, just uh, and you would like one so you can follow along, take a few notes on this book of Jude, then just slip your hand up. One of the ushers will be sure to assist you. Praise the Lord. 22 through 23. If you're there, say amen. Scripture says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And some have compassion, making a difference. How many want to make a difference? I want to make a difference. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for your compassion upon each and every one of us. We stand here as recipients of your grace and mercy. I ask you, Lord, uh, to just grant us your special anointing, a unity that's here tonight. Thank you for this passage, for this great book. Bless us now as we look into it and uh, delve into its riches and its power in Christ's name. All God's children say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Feel the Lord here tonight, don't you? Amen. You can be seated in his presence. I think a lot of it has to do with unity. It's always a good thing to have unity in the church. One of my sayings is... uh, You've probably heard me use it before, but they say even freckles make a good tan if you can get them all together. Amen. So that's a good thing. Tonight we've come to the 65th book in the Bible along Route 66. We've come here to the 26th book of the New Testament. We've got one book left to go. We're going to be doing that one next Wednesday night, the Lord willing. And probably dealing with the topic of the Antichrist because that's probably the most uh, appropriate question, at least of recent uh, months that I've had asked me, uh, dealing from the book of Revelation. So we're going to just take the subject. Uh, Revelation deals with tons of different issues, uh, but uh, the topic of the Antichrist is a big one. And uh, just what are the qualifications biblically? A lot of people have a lot of different ideas. I I was thinking how um, some time back a gentleman approached me and he thought he was the Antichrist. And, um, yeah, he had been smoking something. And that's that's no joke. Uh, But but, uh, there's a lot of different things. And the funny thing is a lot of people know just enough about the Antichrist um, where it's like they're dangerous, really. if you don't follow through with all of the scriptures that tie them together, uh, you can just about make any man the Antichrist. So we're going to be looking at that from what the scripture says. So that's coming next week. But today, or this evening, uh, we're looking at Jude. Uh, the author is believed to be Jude, one of the Lord's brothers, uh, or should I say half-brothers, okay, if you get what I'm talking about there. Uh, who wrote somewhere between A.D. 66 uh, to 80, okay, 66 to A.D., okay. Uh, He was called Judas. Uh, His book is called Jude, probably to differentiate from the Judas, the betrayer, okay. So he was called Judas uh, in Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, and uh, not really... Uh, referred to much those two scriptures we find him mentioned and then maybe acts 15 22 is talking about jude here we're not sure about that but um, seems to be most likely Uh, there's one other biblical reference to him uh, kind of indirectly paul uh, makes an indirect reference in first corinthians 9 5 where he states the brothers of our lord and he mentions how they took their wives along with them on their missionary journeys. So uh, that would no doubt uh, be uh, pointing to Jude. Uh, Jude and James are the only two brothers of the Lord who wrote books in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, we believe, had four brothers, as mentioned in Matthew thirteen fifty-five. Uh, James, Joseph, 
that is called Joseph, uh, Simon, and Jude, or Judas. So those were the four uh, half-brothers, if you will. Uh, now, Jude does not uh, direct his epistle. Let's take a look here. He doesn't direct his epistle like many other epistles are directed. He doesn't direct it to a circle of um, readers or a stated geographical region, okay, to the saints that are scattered through this region like some of the others or whatever. He wrote uh, to believers everywhere, okay, and uh, I like the little book of Jude because his letter begins and ends with very comforting words. In fact, it's been said that his benediction is one of the most beautiful benedictions of any Bible book. Um, and so he's got a lot to say. Uh, he's, he's very powerful in his delivery. And uh, notice with me, however, in verse 1, he describes believers uh, first right out of the gates here. He says, those who are called, preserved, and sanctified in Christ. All three verbs... Uh, I've read, are passive. They stress the action of God. God calls, God sanctifies, and God keeps. Aren't you glad for that? He calls, He sanctifies, and He keeps. And Jude admits uh, that initially, notice on your worksheet, that he was eager to focus on the common salvation that we have as believers. He was probably wanting to write a more upbeat, dynamic, positive little postcard book, but then it seems he was redirected by the Holy Ghost. Uh, The Holy Spirit had other plans, and uh, so he wrote to challenge us to contend for the faith. And so uh, false teachers, obviously, it seems through the text, uh, had crept into the church, turning God's truth into a lustful license okay, to to do as they please. And so Jude reminds those abusers, uh, those uh, people that had taken the grace of God and turned it into lasciviousness, he reminds them of how they're not going to get by with it. God dealt with unbelieving Israel. He dealt with disobedient angels. And finally, he dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice that, that on your worksheet. So it appears that the purpose of the epistle was to pretty much condemned the practices of the ungodly libertines who were at that time infesting the church, corrupting the believers. And uh, so he was counseling them, uh, believers, stand firm, grow their faith, contend for the faith. And, uh, and uh, that's basically uh, Jude in a nutshell. Now, one point unique to Jude is that he's the only individual in scripture that refers i believe to the dispute between michael the archangel and the devil about the body of moses okay and so that's just one observation that is unique to his book uh and so i just wanted to throw that in there now the key thought of the book is uh it is more important than that we do what is needful than what is pleasant more important to do what is needful than to do what is pleasant. The key phrase, earnestly, he said, contend for the what? Faith. The key word is ungodly. He uses it to describe some false teachers about six times. Now let's move on to the outline of the book. Verses 1 through, one through 2 talks about entering the faith. He moves to defending the faith. He mentions those that are departing from the faith, those that are denying the faith, and then the remnant, those that are propagating the faith. And how they do that by keep growing, keep praying, keep loving, and keep trusting. Somebody say amen. Did I go too fast? You got them. Keep growing, keep praying, keep loving, keep trusting. So overall, Jude's message is short. It's to the point. Uh, Sometimes some of his verses are quite stinging uh, and powerful, but no doubt uh, directly inspired. 
because he had another message. He pretty much told us at the beginning, I, I had another message, and he said, Lord, change my message. Okay, so uh, with that as our framework, work, let's deal with our text now. Move to verse 23. And some having compassion, making a difference. And I read that and I said, Lord, help me make a difference. Help me make a difference. How do we make a difference? Let's take just a few minutes here and look together. First of all, to make a difference, we must know our purpose. Somebody said great minds have purposes. Others have wishes. So everyone has a purpose. I'm not talking about a career or a desire or obligation. I'm, I'm speaking about God's purpose for our lives. How many want to tap into that? I do. And if we dedicate our life to God's purpose for us, we'll find that will receive the lasting long-term joy and satisfaction uh, only when we uh, discover God's purpose. There's a joy, there's a peace that comes in discovering God's purpose for our life. Now, secondly, not only we must know our purpose, we must know our principles. Principles. Now, how many know that's an ingredient that's kind of sadly missing today in our culture? When somebody describes an individual as being a, a man or a woman of principle, what's that mean? Well, it means they have some, some integrity. They have some values. Um, convictions are what we believe in. Principles, somebody said, is what we would die for. And whenever there is a separation between principle and practice then there's a breakdown. How many understand that? When there is a uh, difference or a separation between our principle and our practice, then that's why, where we use the word hypocrite, right? Everybody say hypocrite. Um, there's a breakdown. So I, I, I was looking in history, and the ancient uh, people there in China... They desired uh, security, I guess you could call it, from the barbaric uh, invading hordes to the north. So to get that protection, what they do? We hear it called the Great Wall of China. Okay? That's why they built the Great Wall of China. 30 feet high, 18 feet thick. And I think they said it's 1,500 miles long. That's a pretty big wall. That's a pretty big wall. Only man-made structure, I think, that they said is visible from outer space. But the Chinese goal, they said, was to build it uh, so that it would be absolutely an impenetrable defense. Too high to climb over. Too thick to break through, too long to go around. But they said during the first hundred years of the wall's existence, China, though, was successfully invaded not once, not twice, but three different times. And you know why? It wasn't the wall's fault. During all three of those invasions, history says, the barbaric hordes never climbed the wall, never broke through it, never went around it, they simply bribed a gatekeeper. And then they marched right in through the open gate. Isn't that amazing? The purpose of the wall failed. Why? Because of the breakdown in the principle. See? And so when there's a breakdown in values, we're in trouble. When our principles break down, so does our lives so does our culture and our society. And so our principles will help us make a difference. An unprincipled life will lead to destruction. A principled life will guide us when nothing else is left. Hang on to your principles. Right? We need more men and women of principle. Okay. So, so principle, purpose, 
But then finally, we must know our power. And, and you say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about God's Spirit that is to empower our lives. How many want to know Him better? God's Spirit to empower our lives. God has given to each of us, obvious gifts, talents to accomplish His purpose. But I'm talking about outside of that or on top of that. There's, a, there's the gift of the Holy Ghost. And He's the one that can use us to make a difference. Make a difference. All right. So by God's help, we won't waste our lives. Jude says, make a difference with your life. Next, in, his, in the next verse that we read, Jude implies that some confused souls are already in the fire, being singed by the fires of hell, which would uh, engulf them in the future if they are not rescued. Now, I read that verse, and you've read it, I'm sure, many times. How many would agree that imagery is very vivid? Very vivid. Um, Jude reminds us of this critical call to have compassion. Um, the Greek means to actually, uh, I think in our KJV it's pulling them, uh, but in the Greek it means to snatch them, uh, to take them by force, uh, to go on the attack and, and take them. Now, Now, that gets into language in the Greek that's, not gentle at all. Uh, it's it's to be quick about it. There's an urgency. Uh, there's a there's a, a passion that's displayed when you snatch something from the fire. Right? How many has ever had to do that? Accidentally, something goes in. The, you snatch it from the fire. A lot of times, it's too late. Jude must have been a devout student. I I think of the Old Testament because this imagery is no doubt borrowed from the Old Testament. For example, Amos chapter four verse eleven. God says to Israel that they were like a firebrand that He plucked out of the burning. How many remember that reference? Israel was a firebrand that God plucked out of the burning. And uh, God, through the prophet Amos, went on to have kind of a scathing rebuke to Israel because he says, even though I plucked you from the burning, you still haven't turned to me. Uh, But that imagery comes from the Old Testament, God snatching Israel out of the flames of, uh, of destruction. And Jude says we are to do that sort of what God did when we are to, uh, as a church or as believers, to snatch others from the fire. Now, now, how many know the subject of a literal burning hell is not a popular topic these days? It's really not. It's, it's probably the, the least discussed. It's like, ooh, leave that alone. Um, there's been an all-out attack, uh, quite a um, popular author, pastor, um, wrote a book um, and uh, really just sent shockwaves through the evangelical movement uh, a couple years ago. Um, when he wrote his book called Love Wins. And he twisted every scripture nearly about hell and uh, trying to prove that uh, hell would be non-existent. And uh, after it burns for some time, in the end, God, which he refers to as the love, love will win out. And in the end, every soul that is ever born will be taken to heaven. And uh, it's just really a form of universalism, just repackaged is really what that is. But um, after his book uh, caused quite a stir, he resigned his church. He got uh, quite a bit of flack, and rightfully so. Um, But uh, he doesn't admit it, and he doesn't renege. He's still just uh, taking a different turn and, uh, and is going around teaching uh, that, which I think is heresy, right? 
um, because I ask myself, where has the teaching of a literal hell gone these days? Uh, recently, I read about a minister who was going to uh, England, and he was uh, instructed that when he was to pass into Great Britain, he was not to tell the people at the customs uh, that he was a minister or a pastor or a missionary. He was not to use those words. He, he must tell them that he was a teacher, an educator, or a professor uh, to gain entrance into Great Britain. Uh, and, and I read that and I thought, this is the country, church, that once hosted the great London pulpiteers, Charles Spurgeon, Joseph Parker, G. Campbell Morgan, David Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men's sermons are still in print even today, long after their deaths. Uh, Lloyd-Jones was probably the last of these men to die. He died in 1981. But Spurgeon, Parker, they preached there in the late 1800s. G. Campbell Morgan was there in the early 1900s. How could it happen? That country now opposed to any kind of Christian evangelism, regardless of the brand, how could a place that once had the very fabric of, of its beginning to be Christianity, it's drifted so far. I mean, this nation was, Great Britain, once known for their Christian missionary endeavors. I mean, that nation once hosted churches that served as a comfort for its massive, massive working class people. That nation was one that preached that heaven was going to a place where going to be a place where all had the opportunity to go no matter what the social standing was. You know, something happened and it happened in the ministers of that nation. William Gladstone, who was one once the prime minister. Uh, and also a prominent man in the church, gave a clue when he said this, and I quote, he said, hell has been relegated to the far-off corners of the Christian mind. Where's hell gone, he said. And so, so once we answer that question sufficient, sufficiently, where is hell gone, we'll discover for Great Britain where the church is also gone. Because when the hell disappeared... The church disappeared. If hell disappears, there's no need for evangelism, church. If hell disappears, there's no need for holy living. If hell disappears, there is no need for a holy confrontation over fleshly weaknesses. If hell disappears, there's no need for worship. There's, I mean, if hell disappears, there's no need for a true church. Hell began to disappear in Great Britain when the authority of the Scriptures was called into question about the subject of hell. And if a man ever doubts the authority of Scriptures, things will start going missing in his theology. And for those who do not necessarily doubt the authority of the Scriptures but choose to get sloppy with their interpretation of the Scripture, they're just as guilty. And so before long, hell... Uh, disappears from their sight. Another prominent preacher of Great Britain, F.W. Robertson of Brighton, uh, he was among some of the most popular Victorian preachers. He said something like this about, he said something about the preachers of the congregation of, of his day. He said, we've learned to smile at the idea of an eternal hell. For in bodily flaming torture, we believe no longer. He then included himself in among the intellectually and academically escapees who who sealed their own doom. But what so I, and I say all that to say what happened across the pond soon found its way here in America. Right. And now the belief in a burning literal hell has it's disappeared. It has all but disappeared from our society. Many have become ashamed of the gospel. No longer uh, it's proclaimed like Paul did in Romans. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Many are ashamed of a gospel that demands a sense of someone coming to the cross, and a bloody cross at that, 
to seek redemption. Many are ashamed of a, a gospel that demands repentance and water baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost, evidenced by the speaking of other tongues. Many are ashamed of a gospel that calls for a, a, any kind of separation from the world. Many are ashamed of the gospel that promises a home in heaven and teaches there's a hell to shun. So many are ashamed of a gospel that says we'll have to endure the punishment of hell for our sins on this earth unless we accept Christ. I mean, anybody been to the Christian bookstore lately? It's not a bad thing. I mean, but you, you visit the, the, the Christian bookstore and, and see what the top ten Christ, Christian bestsellers in our generation are. You'll find that probably most of those books cater toward self-improvement. Is that not right? Self-help with a slight twist of God. And for those not falling in that category, the rest of the fair is comprised of things that will help you limp through the struggles and the catastrophes of your life. And, and the reality is that Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have got off on that little rabbit trail. The reality is that much, now not all, don't get me wrong. I'm not being a schoolyard bully here. But the reality is that much, like I said, not all, but much of the trouble that comes to our lives is often self-induced because of poor, ungodly choices that landed us there. Like I said, not all, but a lot of when we finally see the inside of our souls and are willing to give ourselves to uh, prevailing honesty, what we find is we need repentance more than we need comfort. Then, all right, we really do. But, oh, you ain't going to find books going to New York Times bestseller on repentance. Oh, it's comfort. Because repentance is a hard product to market in our consumer-friendly country. We want to be left alone with our creature comforts, not giving any mind to the fact that all of us will face death one of these days. And there's going to be a final accounting. And there's only two destinations. Despite our uncomfortable thoughts about a literal burning hell, even though it may have disappeared from our pulpits and our books and our songs, it never disappeared from the scriptures. It's never disappeared from the mind of God. J.C. Ryle, the first Anglican bishop of Liverpool, said this. He said, the watchman who keeps silent when he sees a fire is guilty of gross neglect. And the doctor who tells us we are getting well when we are dying is a false friend. And the minister who keeps back hell from his people in his sermons is neither a faithful nor a charitable man. And I say amen. So what's the scripture say? Okay. Since Jude brings us to the topic, uh, the authority on hell has not been... Universities, seminaries, or even Bible colleges. Furthermore, the thoughts about hell cannot be best understood by, you know, like I mentioned before, the talking heads on, uh, or bloggers on the Internet. Um, the best place to understand that literal burning hell is to look where? What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? Jesus had a lot to say about that topic. And oddly enough, <laughs> get this. <clears throat> in, in Christ's inaugural sermon, anybody remember what that was? The Sermon on the Mount. Okay? In the Sermon on the Mount, 
we began to get a taste of what hell was going to be like. Now, I, I think of that, and wow, you know, the last thing that most preachers do <laughs> when they go and try out at a church, they ain't going to preach on hell. I mean, they pull out of the archives some sermon on encouragement and worship and comfort and something like that, so, so they'll have a better chance of getting voted in. But Christ's first big message to hit the pages of Scripture. You know why he did that? Because his authority came from another world. And when our authority comes from another world, you find that you will not be tied up to the approvals or disapprovals of man. Right? And so, so Jesus, I mean, uh, that doesn't mean that you get nasty or mean. I'm not saying that. But it, it means that your, your purpose is truth. And Jesus loaded up the first sermon with statements like in Matthew 5, He said this, but I say unto you, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of what? Hellfire. Wow. Jesus, couldn't you take it a little easy on us? I mean, kind of slide into that topic. And then for those who were given to adulterous looks and actions and lustful sins of the eyes and the hands, Jesus had advice for them too. He said, if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Which, please, nobody. Your right hand offend thee, cut it off. He's talking about his whole context is you got to get ruthless against sin. Okay, he's not teaching self mutilation. Okay, but he's saying you got to get ruthless about getting the sin out. Okay, but then he says, uh, "For it's better for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body be cast into hell." And when he was commissioning his disciples later, he knew that they would be under incredible pressure to give in and quit. But he said to them that the fear of God is what they should be concerned about. Matthew 10, 28. Because he says, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear them, or fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Lord is appealing to their sense of courage for them to grasp the importance of doing the will of God, even under the most difficult and tough circumstances. Any temporary discomfort here is much more preferable to the permanent judgment that will come with being unfaithful. And so Jesus also said something about those who opposed Him. He said in Matthew 23, He said those that opposed Him, their origin was hell woe unto you scribes pharisees hypocrites for ye can pass the sea and land and make one proselyte and when he is when he is made ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves okay that's some of christ's words on the topic what does john have to say um dad would you get revelation 14 uh, 9 through 12 Revelation 14, 9 through 12. There were numerous things that Paul said about hell, and really he scattered them throughout his epistles. But when we come to the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the book of Revelation, as given to John the Apostle, our understanding, okay, of what hell is about and who will be there gets crystal clear. Okay? This is a topic... Excuse me, an, imp- an important topic that the, the book of Revelation really makes crystal clear. And so uh, if you'll read 9 through 12 of Revelation 14, uh, I'd appreciate it.
Now, in that simple passage, there's a picture here he mentions of some wine that is being poured out. The wine of the wrath of who? God. When it is poured out, it turns the world into a state of intoxication. This unleashing of God's wrath shows that people will have to deal with extreme suffering. This unleashing of God's wrath shows that some in a drunken stupor of God's wrath will experience physical death and destruction. And to get a picture of the wrath of God that he's mentioning during this time, it becomes clear when we take three Old Testament passages and, and kind of merge them together. Psalm 75, 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Here it is again, a cup. And the wine is red. It's a full mixture. And he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Jeremiah 25, 15. For, this, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and calls all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Jeremiah 51, 7, the final verse. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. If the effect of Babylon's wine was intoxicating back in the Old Testament, it is going to be nothing in compared to God's wine. Babylon's wine was, was mixed with water and was diluted. Babylon's wine made the nation submissive to her for a temporary time. Babylon's wine will wear off in time. But God's wine will cause the ungodly to get drunk. God's wine will not be diluted. It will be effective to accomplish his purpose. God's wine is not going to be temporary. And it will never wear off. God's wine will make the nation submissive to his uh, judicial will forever. Most sinners are like a drunk man that's fallen into the fire. That's the picture here. They're drunk on, Jude says they're drunk on worldliness. They've fallen into the fire. They're so drunk that even though they've fallen, they feel secure. They don't know they're about to burn forever. He is this, this, this. This world is drunken. They're literally in the suburbs of hell and don't know it. They can't help themselves. They're unaware. They're oblivious. They're drunk to their spiritual plight. And Jude says, that's where our responsibility comes in to the lost around us. Oh, you feel that responsibility tonight? Let's rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jude says we got a responsibility. So some are lost in the world, and sometimes some are lost even in the church. And and Revelation four ten says, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. I mean, throughout the Revelation, I, I can quote several different texts, the image of fire is used. Simply for judgment. There will be an intense suffering associated with the judgment of hell. But it heightens when John writes the description and says there's a presence in hell of brimstone. So that brings us as we now step into this new dimension where we envision in our mind a picture of, of the eruption of a volcano with molten lava running like rivers and people rolling around in a lake of fire, bobbing up and down, sinking, coming up. Meanwhile, screams. I mean, the word tormented there also has the association of, of spiritual and psychological suffering mixed with all the physical suffering. And so uh, it's, it's accompanied, uh, he said, by weeping and mourning. And I, I just read that and I... I realize when it all comes down to it, there's no sin worth going to hell over. I'm glad I've got a way of escape. I said, I'm glad I got a way of escape. Praise God. 
It's not worth having an offended spirit. It's not worth a lustful activity. It's not worth holding a grudge over. It's not worth breaking Ten Commandments of God over. It's not walking or worth walking around with sin uh, in your life. It's not worth, hey, it's just It's not worth being prayerless. It's not worth being prideful and not coming uh, to an altar and praying. It's it's not worth keeping an unconfessed sin somewhere under the surface. It's not worth the self justification rationalization that we have have uh, that we often excuse ourselves for making and living a low spiritual life. It's just not worth going to hell over. I want to do all I can to make it to heaven. Praise God. How many want to go to heaven? I want to go to heaven. How many want to take somebody with you to heaven? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my goodness, I'm running out of time. Jude said it like this. Others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. My children's worth saving. Your children's worth saving. Your spouse is worth saving. Your friends are worth saving. Your church is worth it. So we have a ministry. A ministry call to participate in what can be a severe operation. You're going to have to roll your sleeves up. As we reach into the fire and rescue those who are already, Jude said, are being singed. They're filthy too. You've got to watch out. They're filthy. He says, hating the garment spotted by the... You reach in, you got to be careful. You, they're so fleshly, they've soiled their spiritual garments. But he said, we've got a job to do. Pull them from the fire. Before the fire totally engulfs them. Christ modeled this for us. And I I often think of, as the musicians come, we get it close. Um, There were those in Christ's society in his day that he ministered to in which um, he snatched from the fires of hell just in time. I think of the thief on the cross. Remember that? Just in the last few breaths. That gentleman, eyes met with Christ. And at that moment, he said, remember me. And Jesus looked back at him and said, this night, just in time, just in time, this night, you'll be with me in paradise. Thank God, just in the nick of time, Jesus rescued him. I've been rescued. How about you? Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want us to uh, I want us to stand and turn to page three ninety six. Three ninety six. I want us to ask the Lord tonight to give us a white hot passionate burden to pull some people from the fire there's a lot of folks in Lorraine County that are right now in the suburbs of hell we need to reach them church we need to reach them start with our families start with our friends 396 it's an old chorus I want us to sing it a couple times and make it our prayer or make it our challenge people need the Lord I believe Jude if he was here tonight he would challenge us to reach him people need the Lord people need the Lord At the end of broken dreams, 
He's the open door. Oh, people need the Lord. Yes, they do. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? People need. God, give us a vision tonight. People need the Lord at the end of broken dreams. He's the open door. Oh, people need. Oh, God, start with us, Jesus. spend my life sing it with me mending broken people I want to spend my life removing pain Lord let my words heal the heart that hurts I want to spend my life mending broken people. One more time. Oh, I want to spend my life. Thank you, Jesus. Mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Heal the heart that hurts. I want to spend. Thank you, Jesus. Mending broken. We take just a couple minutes in the altars. If you got to go, understand. Say, Lord, lay somebody on my heart that I can snatch from the fire. I know ultimately it's going to be their decision. But God, help us to do our part. Help us to do our part. To reach out and reach down. Before the flames of hell engulf them, oh God. Help us to rescue the perishing. Oh God, give us a burden tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want to spin my love.